Joining us now, she is, of course, an Olympian, a national champion, an All-American, was a national champion, All-American at UCLA, Olympian, of course, in the most recent Summer Olympics, and a now AUX champion, which she just recently won in the closest finish in Athletes Unlimited history. I speak of Bubba Nichols joining us here on In the Circle on D1 Softball. How does that new title sound to you? <laughs> no, it's it's pretty cool. Um, I definitely, uh, I didn't know that I'd be sitting here with that title. It definitely was a close finish. And even up until the very, the final out of our final game, I, I still had no idea. So it really was a surprise, but it's super cool just to be able to have that title and be able to have opportunities like this where I get to talk about it and get to talk about the league and all the amazing things with it. Well, let's talk about things. I remember going into that Tuesday. You're, I think you were down like around 200 some points. Jocelyn was in the lead. Uh, take me through that day. Uh, did you think going in you had a chance? Did, like, give me your mindset as you get into that final day uh, and, and kind of your thinking process throughout. Yeah, uh, going into that final day, we had one win, one really good win, and one uh upsetting loss going into the double header day um and so my me and my facilitator mj knighton we really wanted to brainstorm of what would be the best um way to strategize how we can go about trying to just get two victories because before that day every team had yet to win the double header day so we knew we were kind of in for a feat if that was what we were going for. And that was what we were going for was just to win those two games and finish the season on a really high note. And um, I just told the team, you know, like I want all of us, we want to see as many orange names on that leaderboard as possible since we're the orange team. And uh, we just wanted to get people bumped up on the leaderboard because the higher you are, the better it is for um, each person. And so we definitely went in with a strategy of who would pitch and how we think that we could go about um, everyone having an opportunity offensively as well. Um, and we wanted to have a good defense. So I definitely was going into that, that, that day, not knowing the outcome, obviously no one does, but um, I was just hoping for the best. And even that first game, when we went into extra innings, um, I think we just had a lot of energy. I think that was probably the, the highlight of that team that I was on, um, all of them were so experienced with knowing that no matter how long it takes, like we're willing to just, you know, kind of push through it and not really feel like, oh man, this is tough. We still have another game after this. It was like a, this is it. The end of the season's near and we're going to go out and give it all we have. And I think that I had the best team to do that personally. As it's all playing out, are you keeping score in the back of your mind or is it like, or, is it, or do you forget about it while you're playing and then once the game ends, you kind of like, okay, where, what does that mean now? What, what's the mindset like? Yeah. So for me, I being an outfielder, I was center fielder um, for all of AUX. It's very hard to stay super engaged with like the every single decision that's made. So I, I definitely had to rely heavily on MJ to kind of be the bird's eye view for everything that was going on. Um, and I think that was something that was really cool. And not just uh, my facilitator, MJ, but um, just the whole team knew that it wasn't so much of a, okay, we have to figure out, you know, five steps ahead. It's okay to have two steps ahead planned out. And then we'll go from there. It was very much a, let's just see how it plays out. And if it goes this way, here's this plan. If it doesn't go that way, here's plan B. Um, and, uh, going into that day, I definitely wasn't personally focused on any score or what the leaderboard points were or anything like even where I am in the outfield, I'm right next to the scoreboard. So it's very tempting to want to look up and see where you're right. Cause they show it every inning, they show where <laughs> the rankings are and and it's very tempting, but I, I personally, I don't like looking at it. I really try not to, um, just because it becomes a mental game and sure. then it just becomes way more than what I wanted it to be. And at the end of the day, like it, it becomes a lot more fun when you take that off of your mind and I have the ability to just play free. 
Um, and so I was really just trying to rely heavily on what the game presented, not what the leaderboard presented. So that was what I was kind of going off of mindset wise. I didn't realize they had the scoreboard there in the <laughs> where everybody could see it. The players could see it. I did not realize they had that throughout the game. Is that, is that always been the oh, case? Yeah. They, yeah. They, they, you know, they even announce like, let's take a look at the leaderboard and you know, like they'll put every single person up there and, you know, as someone that's on the field, I know it's not just myself, but it can be challenging to, because you don't want to look at your name and have any emotion attached to where you're at, because that's when you start to get into a bad place is when that emotion becomes attached to where you're at, because that's out of your control. All you can do is what you're doing on the field. That is so funny. I mean, that makes sense. They want to keep the fans, uh, in, you know, engaged and updated on what's going on. But I just kind of picture that myself. Like, can you imagine if they did that, like, in college? And they're like, Bubba Nichols is a double away from a cycle. Like, that would be weird. Like, it's, it's just... Oh, right. <laughs> so, yeah, it that's... definitely is. Yeah. So take me now. The, the last game is over. And the games are done. You're walking off the, you know, you, the results done. Do you know where you're at? Are you asking MJ, hey, do you think I want? Because I know on the broadcast they're watching, you know, Natasha Wally was over. They're they're trying, they're waiting to see because all the totals have to be in the the you know the stars of the game, the top three, everything's got to be tallied. So they're not sure. They don't want to say. I remember Natasha Wally was kind of like, I think Bubba's won, but we're not sure. What is going through your mind? Get me through that mindset and from that moment the game ends. And then until you finally find out officially that you've won. Yeah. So when that game was over, I just remember being over the moon that we were the first team to win a double header <laughs> because that was, that is a huge accomplishment for a team to be able to play two games, especially the first game extra innings. So my mind was there. I was like, you guys, we just won the last double header. Like that's huge. And all of us were excited about it. Um, but I remember Kelsey Stewart, she's kind of the, she's very much in tune with numbers and like calculating things before they even happen. And so she's just, she's just constantly, that's how her brain works. She's very much like all about the numbers. And, um, she was even telling me like during the game, before the game was over, she was like, I just calculated it. You did it. Like you got number one. And I'm like, Kelsey, the game's not even over. And <laughs> it was just. I don't know. It, it was just really cool to know that it was that close because I was happy with wherever I, I was like, man, like to have like a top 10 finish is a huge accomplishment. So I was like thrilled that I was even like considered for a top 10, let alone number one. That wasn't at all where my thought process was. Um, and it was just amazing just to see how much my team, like some key players, like really shine on that last day like Billy Andrews she hit two home runs like that was huge and um we Taylor McQuillan she pitched amazing it was just it was so cool to see each and every one of them kind of bring fully what they're all capable of and though I was personally crowned it definitely felt like it was my team that I was the most like proud of in that moment because I knew that all everyone was just able to come together at the right time and it really was the best time for all of them to feel like they could finish on a high note. What does it mean to have players, teammates rooting you on, keeping you updated on where you stand and rooting for you to win the thing? I mean, this is a competition that to some extent is individual. Each one's going to benefit and think, but yet you've got players like rooting you on and keeping you updated where you stand. Right. I think honestly, that's the power of softball and just how much, of a team sport it really does show it is not just softball with baseball any team sport um though we're in an environment that is highly individualistic and it praises individual accolades and um success i think the power of softball is the fact that like a spirit that kind of comes together and roots each other on over supersedes that that individualism and it's pretty cool to see i mean like if you ask any any team uh any team sport athlete out there the second it becomes about the one person it just all falls apart it's like you take the one card away the whole deck just it just t tumbles down you know and um i think that's what's amazing is just seeing how much 
not just, I know that they were doing it for me, but we've all been echoing it to one another the entire season and throughout athletes unlimited. That's been the coolest part is just though it's individualistic, everyone does come together and a team sport does shine even more despite the environment we're in. How do you compare AUX season? And I know it's going to change with the formats and all that next year, but just I'm fascinated by the fact you had the AUX season, you've played in the long Athletes Unlimited season. How do you compare those two seasons? Uh, and, you know, it, it feels like the AUX is like a sprint uh, and it's very popular. Yeah. I mean, they posted the viewership was way up the high most watched season and everything like that. Just describe as, as someone who's been a part of all of it. What, how do you compare this AUX versus the regular a Athletes Unlimited season? Yeah, AUX, it definitely has like pedal to the metal type of feel. <laughs> like you really are just jumping into it and going full throttle with a lot of games right off the bat. Um, those double header days are definitely um, the ones that differentiate the most with from the regular champ season. Um, just because it is, it is, it can be grueling to play, you know, seven potentially plus more innings a day with another seven innings, you know, like 14 innings plus more in one day is a lot, especially, um, anyone that's grown up in the game, like in travel ball, that's like, you know, what you're just thinking of how many times, how long you're at a field and you're kind of bringing that into your professional career. And, um, it definitely, it allows you to have a lot of, um, I guess, autonomy to the way you prepare because it gives you more of a, um, a mindset of like, how am I supposed to have my body ready? How should I go about this day? You know, like I just came off of a double header day, but I still have two more games potentially, or I have, you know, however, whatever the mix is, but um, in champ season, it's pretty structured, just the three games every weekend. Um, you do definitely have more rest in between there, but I would say the biggest thing for champ season AUX is the way that you prepare and take care of your body and your mind as the professional athlete to prepare yourself for the workload. I do know that um, a lot of the women, they would, inc myself included, you have to find yourself, you know, doing lifts and like doing your workouts on the same day that you have a game. Whereas in champ season, you may do your lifts in those three or four days that you don't have games. Um, so I, I honestly, a lot of us see it as kind of a training camp <laughs> for champ season. Okay. Well, for those of us that, yeah, we're doing, we're doing both. Um, it, because it really is like all year round, especially if you're not playing anywhere else in the world, you're, you're really not in game mode. So to be able to be at AUX and kind of, jump in with two feet into heavy competition it's a good way to train and it's a good way to get you prepared for a longer season it's not super long obviously but it does prepare you for a little bit longer of a season for champ no oh, that's a great approach i never thought of that i was curious how you deal with aux and then go right into athletes at limited seas a couple you know a few weeks later on there i'm curious is there been a player that you didn't know well that through AUX has you've kind of gotten to know and you know maybe somebody you were curious to get to know based on their great success was there a player or two that you kind of like stood out to you they're like wow I was cool that to get to know that person maybe after either competing them against them in the past or etc what who anybody jumps to mind yeah um I I definitely have had the privilege of uh playing against or with a lot of them and especially not just in college or prior to college, but also with the USA team. Um, but one or a couple of people actually that I feel I got to know, um, Haley Lee from, she was at Texas A&M and uh, then Oklahoma. Um, she is, she's hysterical. I love her energy. I love the way she plays. She's so lighthearted, but yet she's a competitor. Um, so it was really cool to get to see that side of her rather than just always seeing her from the other, other side of the field, um, or even just on TV. That's really where I've seen her the most. And, um, I also have gotten to know like some of the rookies like Riley West from Tennessee. She's amazing. I think she, she's definitely, she wants to be, you know, sports 
<laughs> broadcaster, I believe, when she's, you know, out of softball, so, or playing softball, so, I, and she's just, she's amazing. I think that she's an amazing human being. She just has such a great head on her shoulders. Um, I love playing with her. She was willing to do whatever it took. Um, and honestly, I just think, like, Billy Andrews, she stood out to me a lot, too, um, though she's kind of, she has a quiet, calm presence about her she's definitely energetic on a field like if you put I put her at shortstop because that girl is athletic and she knows how to field a ball she knows how to move her feet and she knows how to throw a ball and I was like this girl's athletic um and it was just cool to be able to get to know them um it's definitely it can be challenging with AUX since it's such a short season but I was very thankful that I was able to be a captain just to be able to to end up like get to know each and every one of those women and um, just learn more about them and their personality when they're not on a field too. Did you enjoy being a captain and getting to uh, draft or was it stressful? Oh, it's stressful. <laughs> yeah. I don't, those that say it's not stressful, then I, I give kudos because that's just insane. But um, it's definitely stressful because it never goes at all how you plan. You can make several hundred different plans and it will never go a single one, a way of a single one that you paid for. Um, and it was just, I think what's helpful though is the facilitators. I think the fact that Athletes Unlimited provides those facilitators, MJ Knighton being mine um, in that last series, she's a head coach. So I definitely had a lot of wisdom ah. poured into me throughout the draft. And uh, she definitely knows how to strategize really well. So um, it was cool just to be able to have that resource and have her help throughout that draft process. But no, it's stressful because especially you're with the other captains in the same room. Right. So you're all looking at each other and you're trying to get a feel for what they're going to say. And you tease each other because you're they like know who you want. But it really it's it's fun, but it's definitely stressful. Well, and you can't, you know, let them, you know, make sure they know like what you're thinking. Cause sometimes you could, there might be a player in yeah. mind that you wanted and then they take them and they're like, you got to play it cool. Like, all right, that's fine. Even though deep down you maybe are annoyed by it. <laughs> like, right. Like that's yeah. going to be the no, deal. That's exactly true. That's exactly true. You do realize come now the regular season here, they're going to try to put you against Rachel at some point. Like they're going to try to make sure you two go head to head there and compete there. You know, that's going to be set up. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> Rachel, that girl, like her and I, we were roommates two years ago. She's my workout buddy when we're at Athletes Unlimited. So I think that's what's cool is that it's, it's definitely, you're competitive with one another, not just Rachel and I, but all of us. We're competitive with, with one another, but then off the field, we're like, hey, you want to go get some pizza? <laughs> and then go to go hit up the gym, you know, and that's what's fun about it. Of course. Very fun. Very competitive. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, bringing up Rachel. And, you know, I just got to meet uh, Paige Halstead recently, who was helped okay. part of D1 Softball's coverage of the World Series. And we talked to her yeah. about that national championship five years ago. And what was it like? And, you know, getting she, that was the first time apparently she had been back to that stadium since winning that national title, uh, you know, as far as, you know, since she was done playing at UCLA, she hadn't been back. Does five years seem like it's gone by quick? Does it seem like, what, what do you, when you think about that national title season, what, what comes to your mind there? Is it, wow, that was like 10 day, or like a minute ago, or is it like, does it seem long ago? What does it mean to you? It feels like it was yesterday, yet it also feels like it was five years ago. <laughs> Definitely a lot has changed since then. A lot has happened, not just on the collegiate stage or the Women's College World Series, but also just in our own individual lives that looking back, we just remember, you know, I was only, shoot, maybe I think I was 21 at the time and now I'm 26 years old. So I was even a lot different. And I know that a lot of us are all different in the way that we, we view not just the game of softball, but life overall. Um, but I, I definitely, that was definitely one of the most memorable experiences of my softball career, being able to win that national title and have Rachel as our, you know, our ace and page behind the plate and 
it, it, it was just a great, it was a great team. It was one that was not expected, but it was the one that came out on top. And I love underdog stories like that. That's right. Uh, it, big story there. And of course, we'll never forget Rachel's walk off against Washington to get to the champ series. Oh, and then yeah. of course you win the walk off in game two against Oklahoma. I mean, is there any, there's always any trash talking at like, are you talking to Jocelyn? Like, Hey, you know, yeah, sorry about five years. You know, my school beat your school five years ago. Is there any of that going on or no? You know, surprisingly, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I feel like you do hear that a lot in other sports. I don't know what it is. Maybe softball is just, you know, we have a certain etiquette that we follow. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. Fair. But, Fair. Um, yeah, I definitely think that a lot of, like Jocelyn, for instance, she has done a lot in her softball career after that moment. Um, and, and likewise, and I think a lot of us just look back and cherish it because those moments, they definitely fueled the years that came after. And it's part of a special time where Jocelyn and Rachel – were like it almost seemed like they were exchanging like who's the best player in the sport like winning national player of the year like it had to be pretty cool uh to see be a part of greatness uh like you were with your teammate Rachel and then Jocelyn they're great players at Oklahoma I mean that's people really enjoy when your two teams play no matter what you know what was at stake right yeah now you mentioned you were how young you were during that. You, a lot of great stuff happened to you while you were like, I, re, I remember the first time I saw you in person was when you were on the U.S. junior <laughs> team in 2017 in Clearwater, where you just dominated that tournament. Like, it felt like every at-bat you were hitting a home run. People were shocked when you didn't, and you dominated. You won, helped win the U.S. the gold medal. What do you remember about that? Because that was, you know, you were young at that time. But people took notice at that time. That's what, you know, I remember talking to Laura Berg, who was the head coach at the time, and she's done it all in the sport. She said that was one of the greatest performances she's ever seen any player at any age in a big stage like that uh, performance. What do you recall from that event? So, yeah, that that definitely, um, 2017, yeah, and a little 19-year-old Bubba. Um <laughs> I definitely had a an interesting freshman year prior to that summer. I um, injured my hand and I wasn't doing as well as what I was thinking I would based off of um, the way that I was ranked and uh, talked about in high school. I won Gatorade Player of the Year. And so there was a lot of expectation, it felt like. Um, to go into my freshman year and it didn't really pan out the way that I had pictured but I just remember going into that summer with the junior USA team just kind of really just letting go of expectation and allowing myself to to attempt to have fun again and I really think that I did and a lot of that I credit to what I did off of the field um, <laughs> I tell people uh, the story about my my first and only tattoo that I have, um, it was, <laughs> I got it the day before our, our national or our championship game that summer. And I just think it's hysterical because if I were to, looking back on it now as a 26 year old, I'm like, okay, clearly that's not the <laughs> wisest decision. <laughs> but I definitely know that that was kind of an example of the way that I was going about playing was to not put so much pressure on how I would do on a softball field. I was just, I realized that I was just a 19 year old trying to figure it out. And softball was what I got to do, not who I was. And um, I just enjoyed, I enjoyed playing and it really does. The outcome does play out um, most of the time, how you want it to. When you're just having fun so well you had fun uh the only negative was it the rain came down pouring before right as they were going to do the, the gold medal ceremony in clear water so we okay. uh that, that was bizarre like everybody's chasing down of course yeah. you're at adc moore stadium it's not the there's like not a lot of cover places there if at all there you, you literally got to go places to like find hiding there but you always you know that kind of set the tone for your future because 
You would represent Team USA in a lot of events after that, and that would pay off down the road as you made the Olympic team. Uh, for you know, and mm-hmm. I remember they, they cited many reasons. You obviously, I remember talking to you, my producer did actually, Victor co host, talked to in Clearwater during the tryouts, and people were impressed by your versatility. But the fact they always played in big game you so well, it when the, the, the lights were bright, whether it be at UCLA or with Team USA, where did that come from? Of you know, the with the stakes so high, you played your best. Um, you know, I I really feel like I, I've always kind of seen a pressure situations, I guess, as they kind of give me an adrenaline rush. <laughs> and I, I definitely feel like I was born somewhat of an adrenaline junkie, but softball was the outlet for it. Um, I'm definitely not the type to go skydiving. And so I could if I didn't have softball, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, I, I definitely find some joy in, you know, the moments I get my heart rate up and make me feel, they make me excited and a little giddy. Um, so I don't know if that's just the way I was born was just to be able to enjoy those moments. But um, I also know that when I simplify and don't ever make moments bigger than what they really are, um, I always enjoy myself much more. And I've always thought of it like, you know, just being a neutral, being on neutral. Like I don't want to get too high and I don't want to get too low. I always want to be on neutral because even if you're on neutral, you can still enjoy the moment. Doesn't mean you're not enjoying it. And that's kind of how I've always played. Um, and just not getting too overly emotional with, with circumstances or situations. Do you remember the day, the time when you found out you made the Olympic team and, and what was your, re- what went through your mind when you got, you know, you found out, oh, wow, I'm going to be an Olympian. Yeah. <laughs> so the day I found out I was going to be an Olympian, um, I guess this kind of plays into what I just said <laughs> about not getting too high or too low, <laughs> but I, I was actually just in my hotel room and I was actually working on my homework <laughs> for school and I didn't even I knew what time we were going to all get an email that said the roster I just was so I guess unfazed by I was like I'll find out eventually like I'll just keep working on my homework and I got a whole bunch of texts and the first text message that I got on my computer as I was working on my homework was from Rachel and she just said, congratulations, I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, that's weird. And so then I, that's when I, yeah, I was like, well, maybe she's, I don't know what she's talking about, but I guess I'll just like go to the email. Apparently she saw something. And um, <laughs> I went to the email and I was like, oh my gosh, there's my name. And I was, and then all of a sudden I just started getting text message after text message and all this stuff of like all the girls that also had made the team and they immediately sent a message out saying go down to the lobby and we went I closed my laptop (laughs) I decided to put give homework a break um and I went down the lobby and everyone was just we were all skipping through the lobby and to our first team meeting and it was it was super cool it was definitely a moment that I'll remember forever. That was like probably one of the few times where you were, in a way you were glad you were doing homework because it kept you distracted from thinking about it, right? right? Like, what? Right. But, but how fitting was it that you find out from Rachel, basically, in, indirectly? Yeah. No, yeah. It, I think that was what was the coolest part was that it came from Rachel and knowing that she, we were going to be on the same team again. Um, that was the be- That was the best part about it. It was obviously it's been well documented how unique that Olympics, how bizarre it was. It got delayed for a year with the pandemic and everything, and then Tokyo 2021. But the thing that I remember was your coach, Kelly Inoue Perez at UCLA, make going out of her way to make sure that you and Rachel were going to be a part of that Olympics. Uh, because because everything got turned around and you know the Olympics were in the summer of 21, you ended up pl- you both played in the 2021 season, but you had some injuries. Uh, to deal with just take speak to that time period because you're the young kids you're playing college but you're you know you got the olympics on the horizon but you have a coach 
who understands what that means and is looking out for your best interest there? What well, take me through that time period? Yeah, uh, Coach I, she's definitely super supportive of any Bruin that's on an Olympic stage. Like take every single Bruin that has gone through the program and has been a part of the Olympics. Like even our assistant coach, Lisa Fernandez, for instance, like she's literally one of the greatest Olympians and softball players to go down in history. And um, just for coach, I, she, she was one of the ones her and Kirk Walker pre helped prepare her for the Olympics. Yeah. So she definitely had, um, she definitely had a very, clear understanding that this is important because you're carrying on something greater than just, Oh my gosh, Rachel and Bob are going to the Olympics. Like this is part of a legacy that's been developed over years. And, um, I, I think that's, what's the coolest part about having a support system in our coaches like that and knowing that they're always going to support, um, whatever we pursue and especially on an Olympic stage to represent your country and also be a part of the broom bubble. That's, it's a huge legacy um, that, you know, all of us hope that a lot more Bruins will carry on and we know they will um, into the future as softball is more a part of the Olympics. What do you take from that experience in Tokyo there, uh, playing with some of the greats? I mean, you got to play with Kat Osterman and Monica Abbey. You got to be around them. What, what do you take from that experience that maybe could come in handy down the road in the future? Yeah. Uh, so Kat Osterman, she was actually my roommate. <laughs> really? So I, I, yeah, so I, I was the youngest, uh, and then it was Deja and then Rachel. Um, but I was the youngest and obviously like Kat, she was the older, the oldest player, um, on our, on our team. And it was just kind of funny. And we always laughed about it, how the oldest was with the youngest um but she definitely helped me to stay very like I said that neutral she's very wise in the way that she goes about the sport of softball and um just how she goes about preparing for anything I think that it was really cool to just see what she was like even off of a field um she would wake up early in the morning call her husband talk to her daughter and you know and here I am like a little little 20 <laughs> 21 year old and I'm like uh, you know, I, I just, I have a, a boyfriend at the time, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just hearing her and, uh, all of, you know, she's super mature and she has so much experience, um, not just on an Olympic stage, but just in life way more than me at the time. And, um, so it was just really amazing to be able to be more close knit with her and get to know her really well. She definitely mentored me in a lot of ways off of the field, but just, um, you know, how to stay resilient, how to your work ethic. Um, she definitely gave me a really good life advice about just what I wanted to pursue and how I wanted to help others. Um, and we were both strong in our faith. So just being able to talk about that together was really cool as well and um, support one another. But um, yeah, just at the Olympics, it was definitely an interesting time because like it, the only people in the stands were photographers and reporters and that was it you could hear a dime drop in a stadium that could fit thousands of people it was pretty insane um but I would honestly say the biggest thing that I learned from that Tokyo Olympics was the ability to um stay true to yourself despite your circumstances um, it was really, it was really challenging on not just, not just me, but all of us in how we didn't have our families around. We didn't have, um, the friends that, you know, support us, the coaches that support us and helped us being able to be directly there to witness us on that stage. Um, but I definitely learned a lot from those women and from that circumstance of stay true to your process and what it took you to even get there in the first place, because though life changes around you, you don't have to change with it. You can still stay true to the way to what you got you there. Um, and I think that's something I'll carry over and teach others as I grow up in, in this softball community. The sense I get to talking to some of the players or teammates on that Olympic team is there's a unique bond that will last forever in that 
first of all, not only that you're Olympians together, but because it was such a unique and surreal Olympics, one that we hope it's never see again, honestly. Uh, right. Like you mentioned, you couldn't see your families. You, you, know, you had to be basically uh, within only jurisdictions. There was restrictions. That probably grows that bond, doesn't it? That you all kind of needed each other to get through all that. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that bond was, I think that was the the blessing that we had each other amongst that time. Um, like a lot of us were strong in our faith and we really had to rely heavily be on that faith in that time because of the fact it, it felt like the world was falling apart, yet we were just trying to play a sport. It felt weird. You know, it felt at times like, am I doing the right thing? Like there's so many other worse things going on in the world, but this is once in a lifetime, you know, like this is what we've worked for. And so it was just a mix of emotions to see on the news or hear from family about even bigger problems that were happening, but then to be in our bubble together of, oh my gosh, like let's, uh, we like the fact that softball brought us here together, it, it really did unite us in a way that I don't think any other situation could have um, because it put us in that circumstance of needing each other more than we did if we weren't in a pandemic. Um, and even after the fact, just reaching out to each other, being able to check on one another. Ali Aguilar, um, our second baseman for the Olympic team, she she baptized me, you know, and that's, that's how much I know that um, there's that close knit bond of, you know, it goes deeper than sport. Sport definitely unites us, but it, it definitely is that tool to unite us even greater in a lot of other ways of life. Wow. That's great. Well said. Uh, thank you for sharing that. That's a pretty cool uh, deal. And I still can't get over the fact you were roommates with Kat Osterman. Like that's, that's <laughs> yeah. like a, like a, were you like, were you Deja, like Rachel, were you kind of like in shock or like, I mean, I guess you've known her by then. So maybe it wasn't as big of a deal, but still that's like, here it is one of the, you know, Mount Rushmore's of softball. And yeah, she's our roommate. Yeah. I think it was definitely hysterical. All of us more so were laughing about it than anything. <laughs> Even Kat thought it was funny. Um, but we honestly just rolled with it. Cause we're like, that's kind of fun. You know, the oldest with the youngest, like that's kind of a cool cool experience. Um, and I even told her how, when I was shoot eight, eight, nine years old, <laughs> I had a, I had a poster of her on my bedroom wall Yes, and it was signed by her. And, you know, she thought it was hysterical and she was like, the fact that we're roommates right now is cracking me up. And, um, but she definitely, <laughs> she was definitely, I I'd honestly couldn't imagine rooming with anyone else i think that it definitely i i think that god had a purpose and being able to have her be my roommate yeah. um because she definitely was someone that helped me being the youngest get through that time of experiencing such an interesting olympics and career honestly did you still have that poster like by any chance like or or, or like oh is that what... yeah that's it's at my mom and dad's house actually oh. but it's for sure still there did you ever show yeah. it to her? Did you I ever have... show it to her? No, I, I described it to her because oh. I, it's like, you know, yeah, it's, I said, it's the one where it has like, she's like here. Oh and yeah. She's yeah. She's like making this and she's like looking, I think it might be like cheetah print or something in the background. <laughs> I don't, it's like some weird print. And I told her that it's like huge. It's not small either. It's like a giant poster. And my mom got, a special frame for it and I hung it in my room because I used to be a pitcher and yeah I'm like this is actually hysterical the fact that I had a poster of you growing up and now you're my roommate for the Olympics so you never know you never know what will happen that's a great message though the young people I mean I mean who would have thought you got this poster and then she would end up being your teammate in the Olympics and your roommate years down the road like fulfilling a dream come true like that that's that's like, that's really like, you know, I mean, if you put that in a movie, I don't think a movie director would like accept that script. I mean, that's a Hollywood type there. No, for sure. I, and I definitely, I, I you know, like not just the fact that yes, like, I, wow, what an amazing blessing that I was able to get to an Olympic stage. But the fact that Kat 
was able to stay in the game for so long to sure. be able for us to like cross paths. Like it was really like you, it had to be perfect scenario for both of us. And it was just, it was insane. You, right. No one could have written it better. Right. She had come back from un un unretired for that Olympics. I mean, that's like, I mean, it was meant to be. That's cool. That's pretty awesome. Uh, obviously, yeah. the next Olympics for softball will be in 2028, uh, which is in Los Angeles. Of course, news just came out. That's going to be actually played in Oklahoma City, which got a lot of reactions. When you heard that, what, what went through your mind when you heard the news that the A, the Olympics are back, the softball Olympics are back in 2028, but now it'll be in Oklahoma City, not necessarily in LA because of the facilities? Yeah, um, definitely a lot of mixed emotions, just as much as everyone with, you know, how, how it was announced um, and when it was announced, I definitely was more in shock and just kind of, I, my initial reaction was, man, you know, I really wish it was in LA considering the fact that, you know, I'm, I was at UCLA and I just thought it would be such a cool opportunity for knowing so many young girls and fans in, in at Los Angeles who would have the opportunity to watch softball on Olympic stage in Los Angeles. That was what a lot of us, um, you know, Bruins especially were excited for. And um, but when they announced it was in Oklahoma, it definitely was like, man, that's so far. Like as someone that, you know, we've gone to the World Series and it, it is kind of a trek to go from California to Oklahoma. It's not just a couple hour drive away. Um, it definitely was like, man, that's going to, we wonder the, the logistics of it and all this stuff. But ultimately, I think that, um, I think that it will be a cool opportunity for um, that stadium and just for, you know, that it used to be, it's Devon Park, now, but the hall, it used to be the Hall of Fame Stadium. Um, just be able to host that, that is, it is pretty cool for that area and just being able to have that under their, you know, list of, I guess, accomplishments that they've been able to host. Um, but overall, I am a little, you know, like uh, bummed for the future Olympians of just like not being able to be fully with other Olympians because just playing, yes, that is half of it but also being able to stay in the Olympic village, meet other Olympians, the best at their sports. Like that was the other half of it because yeah. that would made the whole experience. Um, so it was tough, but I, I definitely, you know, I, I had a mix of emotion, emotions just like everyone did when that was announced. Yeah. It's weird because on the one hand, they're trying to take care of the, the softball athlete because it is great facility. You play in a softball stadium uh, instead of trying to be forced into a baseball stadium surroundings. Uh, but on the other hand, it just feels weird on Oklahoma. You've played on both. You've played, obviously, at Oklahoma, you know, the softball state, but you've played on the baseball. It, how big of a difference is that? Is that something that – because I know some players yeah. don't like playing on the baseball stadium, but some like, hey, it doesn't matter right. to me. that It's just as fine. I would rather play at Dodger Stadium, for example, or things like that. What Where do, where do yeah. you stand on that, playing on a baseball stadium versus playing, obviously, in a natural softball stadium? Yeah. Uh, definitely there's, um, pros and cons of both, but I, I, I feel like USA is very familiar with playing on literally any type of field. Um, they, they'll go to minor league field, stadiums yeah. and, um, shorten the fence. And we, we've had to play on a number of baseball fields before. And even the Olympics in Tokyo, that was a baseball stadium. That was not a softball, like a true softball stadium. Um, and so you really do. Um, you, you, it is a benefit to be able to have an all dirt field and just being able to experience a little bit more of a true softball stadium. But at the end of the day, the game is the game. It doesn't matter where, what surface it's on. If you love playing that game, you can play it on a, a grass field, not saying that that's what <laughs> I'm advocating for, but, um, I definitely think that the love of the game, it supersedes any conditions, but um, I definitely think that there is a type of, you know, there is adversity in trying to adapt if you've never done it before, but I definitely think it's doable to adjust to. Is 2028 a goal of yours? Is that something on the back of your mind or is that not even, a, are you not even thinking about that? Are you just going year by year? What, what's your mental approach when it comes to all that? Yeah. Uh, for me personally, I really am kind of taking it year by year. Um, I've, 
I've had a whirlwind of life circumstances that have just, you know, taken me by storm. And I, I definitely have a lot of aspirations with wanting to be involved in the softball world. And I'm really, you know, trying to see where's my body at, where's my mental health at, where, where am I at as far as keeping up with the game and also, um, you know, pursuing the other things, a part of softball. Like I really do want to get into coaching. That's what my, my master's degree was in. Um, and just being able to be mentored as, as a graduate assistant at UCLA, like it was super cool to learn under Lisa, coach Lisa and coach Kirk and, and coach I, and just seeing how they operate a team. Um, so it really is something that I really want to pursue heavily, but I definitely don't think coaching takes anyone away from playing or it takes me away from playing, but I am taking it year by year just to see, because ultimately it is a sacrifice being a part of the Olympics is a huge sacrifice. And, um, there's been many women who have had to sacrifice a lot to be a part of the Olympics. And, um, it really is something that, you know, if those cards are dealt, I have to play them how they're dealt. So, um, we'll see, honestly, I, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I'm just taking it year by year, honestly. You say you want to get into coach. You want to coach in the collegiate level. Is there a preference there? And is it something that you want to only start coaching when you're done playing or would you be willing, or would you like try to do both? Um, I definitely want to be in the collegiate setting. I think that there's just something so unique and special about um, being in college softball. It developed me and not just as a player, but as a person tremendously. And I think that it's, it's a huge, um, it's a huge stage to be able to be on, to grow as a woman. Um, and I, I really want to be a part of that in any way of serving the younger generations of softball players and women that I can, um, and just being able to develop them, not just as athletes, but as people. Um, but yeah, I love playing like the fact that athletes limited, it is in the summer. Um, it's allowing me to be able to consider both. Um, but I definitely have to see where I needed the most to be able to serve the best. And um, so I really am just enjoying being able to play right now because I never know in the future what will happen. And um, yeah, but I definitely want to coach at the collegiate level and the highest level possible if I can. Well, that'd be a benefit to the college game if you're involved in the coaching. So that at least we get the word out now. You want to get, you know, want to get coached. There you go. You want to get the deal there. <laughs> Uh, people now know. So you're going to get phone calls after this. I'll, I'll, I'll just take the 1%, you know, <laughs> gross on, on the salary there. Uh, but let's talk about it as we wrap it up. You, you're getting ready uh, for this, obviously, next athletes are limited after winning the AUX. Make a pitch. Tell the audience that maybe haven't followed it on a day-to-day -day basis or maybe are going to check out Athlete is Limited for the first time. What can they expect? Why should they tune in? And I know because you play not just for yourself when you're part of Athletes Unlimited. Yeah. So athletes unlimited is an amazing opportunity where it's just the pool of, uh, 64 women what the champ season is. Um, and we all get to be drafted every single week for five weeks onto different teams. Um, there's no other environment like that. It's definitely, it's a fun way to see athletes compete with other, uh, other athletes, simultaneously just being able to see them adapt to new teams and strategies and lineups. It's really a cool way to see how an athlete handles adversity. Um, but also they represent something a lot greater. Um, they celebrate a lot of many, many, many things that athletes unlimited. And, um, one thing that I reason why I really love athletes unlimited is because of the causes that they do um, allow athletes to play for, which, you know, nonprofit organizations. Um, and for me, mine is Athletes in Action, um, which is actually a faith-based organization that um, I decided to represent for my first season all the way up until now. Um, and they were here at UCLA when I came back from the Olympic or with the Olympic team and the pandemic and whatnot. Um, they were actually the first community that I had here at UCLA that more so helped me focus on my faith with being a softball player. Um, and so it's really cool that I get to represent them at a professional level and be able to um, 
you know, have some of my earnings be directly benefit them. Um, and that's something that's really cool. And, and not just, you know, athletes in action, but there's like a number of organizations, Natasha Watley foundation. She's a really big one that a lot of the athletes represent. Um, there's a lot and it's cool to hear each and every one of the women and, uh, their reasoning for why they choose their organization, because there's always a really cool backstory, um, as to why. And so, um, I think athletes and unlimited does a really good job of sharing those stories and allowing people to know that we're on a mission that is greater than just softball because it is cool to grow the game, but it's cool to grow other um, other organizations and, and things that we're passionate about. That's fantastic. And where can people follow you? And, and then from, if they want to get more information and, and just kind of follow you along with all and, and all the great causes you're doing. Yeah. So I'm mostly active on Instagram at Bubba Nichols. Um, and I also have a Twitter, but I'm not as active, there. but Fair. Um, that's at Madeline underscore Nichols. Um, and you know, you can honestly follow me, keep up with the most recent stuff that I'm up to on, on Instagram. That's where I like to keep people in touch with our scheduling and what we're up to and what I'm up to. So very smart, yeah. smart move by you. Uh, that's Madeline, <laughs> Madeline Bubba Nichols joining us here and in the circle on T1 softball. Hey, thanks so much for uh, taking the time. It's always a blast to get to talk to you. I was excited to see you kind of pull out that AUX championship, which was dramatic. Uh, I've always wa enjoyed watching you play since watching you in Clearwater put on the show that you did, but maybe a few mm. years back, we'll just call it that way. Um, congrats on the, the AUX championship. Good luck here in a few weeks and uh, hope to have you on again down the road. And uh, but in the meantime, thanks for always uh, talking to us. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric.